For those who are watching the recording, we will begin shortly. Did you guys hear that when it said recording in progress? Okay. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. if you heard or not. Because if I don't hit record now, then I will forget when I start talking. Um, all right. So people are just coming in. Hi, everybody. Um, so Val, that's the downtown building behind the um, person who says Michael Bruckheimer. It's just a picture ah. of the historic building downtown. Oh, it's interesting. It is. They call it the cupcake. Yep, the kosher cupcake. That's only part of the building. So we have two campuses, downtown and um, um, no. Oh, hang on, hang on. Looks like a cupcake. The kosher cupcake. <laughs> Call it the bucket. Back in the eighties. Here's Judith Fails. Okay, we'll give it like another two minutes. We now have eight people plus me out of 23 people who are signed up. So I think people are just coming a little late. <clears throat> Thank you all for being on time. Um, so, I know it's a beautiful sunny day, so I appreciate that you're all on your computer. Is it sunny in Toronto? It is. It's gorgeous. All right. Well, it's an yeah. hour, so I'll, I'll be your lunchtime entertainment. Um, and then tomorrow we have Rabbi Josh Weinberg, who's also phenomenal. He's definitely going to be, and he's speaking about something totally different than I am. Um, he's going to speak about what's happening with Hamas. And as you know, there's more things that just escalated yesterday or today, yeah. depending on which whose time zone you're looking at. And he'll also speak a bit about the elections all in an hour. All right, it's 12.03, so I'm going to start because I do have to stop right at 1. So Val, this, the beginning part of this is going to be um, very familiar to you, so you can just um, you can read your email or something for this. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my Israel street cred. Um, <clears throat> and just as a way of um, introduction, so um, I'm not, you know, some rabbis don't have um, you know, they've been to Israel, they might have led some trips, but um, I have a lot of background with Israel. So I come from a hugely Zionistic family. Um, my grandmother was very involved in Hadassah in Massachusetts. She was the head of her chapter, and she made me a life member of Hadassah when I was seven. I just found my three-generation Hadassah pen yesterday. Now people are being made life members when they're in the womb. But when I was seven, I, there were no child life members. I think I was the first child life member. And my mother took me out of school. I do remember that. And I went to this huge luncheon and it was a big deal and I was in the newspaper. So back then it was huge. My parents used to take me, um, we lived in New Jersey growing up. I used to go marching for Israel um, on the streets of New York. And it was something that was always part of our family's um, value system to be very pro-Zionistic. I took all of my bat mitzvah money and I went and did um, a Israel program the summer after I my bat mitzvah. I was still 13 years old. It was seven weeks. It was sponsored by the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA. And that was my first Israel experience. And I thought, wow, I want to go back for an extended period of time. And I thought I will do so in between um, high school and college. So I graduated from high school in three years. And then I did a kibbutz ulpan program for a year. It was in 1978. 
seven. Um, I lived on a, on Kibbutz Ein Dor. It was um, a labor Zionist kibbutz. It was at the base of, Har of Mount Tavor, um, very close to Afula near Tiberias. And that was a really interesting experience for me. So part of my day was spent on doing an opan and part of my day was spent volunteering and we traveled all over the country and met people from all over the world. Then I came back, went to college. Then I um, worked for two years and then I started rabbinical school. So our first year of rabbinical school, you go to Israel for a year, um, HUC in Jerusalem. So in 1984, I went back to Israel. It was a very different experience living in an apartment in Jerusalem. And then my first job out of rabbinical school was at Holy Blossom Temple in Toronto. And as part of my position there, I led trips. Um, Holy Blossom is a very Zionist-minded um, synagogue, so I was very involved um, with their Zionist activities as well. I went to the mar I led one of the I think I led the second March of the Living with a group of 110 students from Toronto. But then um, after I left Holy Blossom, I went to Connecticut um, to a solo congregation. But then I moved back to Toronto and became the head of the a reform movement in Canada and the head of Arts of Canada, the Zionist arm of the Canadian reform movement. So I was very involved in um, Zionist causes through that. So all in all, I've been to Israel 30 times. I've led many trips to Israel, but not tourist trips, a few tourist trips with my congregation, but I led study trips to Israel where we used Israel as a living lab. And we studied things that you, you couldn't really study if you were here, you could, but it's not the same. So we would spend the morning studying and then the afternoon seeing things that were really different and unique. I'm very good friends with Rabbi Gilad Karif, who became the first reform rabbi to become a member of Knesset just now. He was just sworn in as a member of Knesset. And um, I've raised a lot of money for the Israeli reform movement because I've done eight bike rides, eight fundraising, fundraising bike rides in Israel as part of a bike ride that doesn't exist anymore called um, Riding, Ride for Reform. It was a, one of those fundraising bike rides. So I have been to Israel many times. I've talked about Israel. I come from a Zionist family. My politics, people will think I lean really far left. I think I'm just, I'm very middle of the road, probably leaning a little to the left, just so you know where I stand. So I just wanted to put all of that in context. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, we're really just touching the surface. There's so much to talk about. Israel is really complex and complicated, um, and it still is a very new modern country, and people like to express their opinions without knowing the facts. And I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you shortly. And we will have time for discussion, and I'm going to set the context for that as well. And people also like to believe everything they read in the newspaper. But we ha need to remind ourselves that the newspaper is very one-sided and doesn't always present um, a clear picture. And some of what we see in the press is also manipulated, and it's manipulated to one side. And unless we go there and see things with our own eyes, we will not get a full picture. And it's easy for us to be armchair critics, but we are not there. And unless we hear from people who live there, it's hard to understand. But as Jews, we get a voice in what happens in Israel because Israel is our national homeland, our Jewish homeland, and we get to vote every time there's a World Zionist Congress election. And so it behooves us to understand really well what's happening, not just to understand it by listening to really knowledgeable people from here, but it behooves us to go, to see for ourselves what is happening, to listen to people there, not just go as tourists, though Israel needs tourists, but to go and to meet with people on both sides 
to hear with an open mind and to see for ourselves what is taking place. It's hard during COVID, but it's really important to go. So now I'm gonna share my PowerPoint and we're gonna start. Alrighty, this is like way, this is not where I wanna start. I wanna start here. So today we are going to talk about um, how can we express our Ahavatzion, which means love of Zion. And Zion is, doesn't just mean Jerusalem. Zion is an expression that means Israel. How do we express love of Israel when we have conflicting views? And you can have conflicting views within yourself. How can we have a dialogue about Israel when people might disagree with us and people might disagree with us within our congregation people might disagree with us within our family and how can we have a civil discourse about some of these issues it's very heated we know even within congress it's heated we know even within the jewish community there are multiple factions about what is going on and i promise i will leave enough time for a discussion so first i'm going to share some texts from jewish i'm a rabbi i love to share texts so we're going to first look at this ahabat Zion first and look at some texts and look at it from a historical perspective and and we could spend a whole course just looking at text so i know that this is not a really good overview it's just a little taste because we need to understand what, from a Jewish perspective, a Jewish historical perspective, what that ahavatzion means. And then I'm going to stop the screen share, and then we're going to engage in dialogue. And I assure you that I do not have all the answers. Because if I did, I could win the Nobel Peace Prize. All right, so the first text comes from Psalms. And I think this is a very famous text that many of you probably know. In fact, Don McLean even wrote a very famous song. By the waters, the waters of Babylon. Does that sound familiar? We lay down and wept and wept for the Zion. It goes way back to like the 70s. Somebody would like to somebody read this? It's from Psalm 137. By the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there were there, there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing of the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I remember, O Lord, against the Edomites... If I do not remember you... I, uh, I lost my place. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, raise, raise it, raise it, down to its foundations o daughter of babylon you devastator happy shall be he who requites you with what you have done to us happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock all right so we're not going to spend tons of time talking about this because we have so many things to talk about so in a nutshell what is psalm 137 so first of all this is was written after nebuchadnezzar and the babylonians came and uh, invaded the land of Israel and took the Israel the Israelites captive in the year 536 um, before the common era and what is this saying in a nutshell anybody you gotta unmute yourselves if you're gonna say something 
a volunteer. So the Israelites were in Babylonia and they're saying, no matter where we are, the land of Israel and, and Jerusalem will always be in our hearts and our minds. No matter where we are, we will not forget you. We can be in Babylonia, we can be wherever, and we will be sad. We will be terribly sad. We'll be in mourning that we're not there. This was like the first of the many diasporas, right? How can we sing? How can we sing God's songs if we are not in the land of Israel? This is horrible for us. So this is a song of mourning, Psalm 137. All right, keep this in the back of your mind. Now, this is an ancient map of the world. Looks like a flower, doesn't it? Um, this is Europe. This is Asia. This is Africa. And this is the land of Israel. This is Jerusalem. So where is, don't read the text on the side. Where is Jerusalem? Right in the middle of the world. It's right in the middle of the world. Everything revolves around Jerusalem and Israel. It's the heart of the universe. Pretty interesting, right? And now a midrash. This is actually a compilation of midrashim. Somebody else volunteer to read over here. Somebody? Just as the navel is located in the center of the human being, so the land of Israel is the navel of the world, as it is written, who dwell in the navel of the land, Ezekiel 38, 12. The land of Israel sits in the center of the world, and Jerusalem in the center of the land of Israel, and the temple in the center of Jerusalem, and the sanctuary in the center of the temple, and the ark in the center of the sanctuary, and the foundation stone, Evangelia in the front Evangelia. of the sanctuary. Thank you. In front of the sanctuary from which the world is founded. So what is this saying? It's saying it, it just keeps bringing things tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter into what's the center of humanity or the center of being and everything else are concentric rings that take us a little bit further from the middle or further from the exact center of Judaism. Not even not and not even Judaism, but everything starts here and radiates out and it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or not everything starts here so the foundation stone of the world starts here that's what it's saying right so we're going to go on to the next one this is a third century and we're not going to even go back to all of these this is a mizrach a mizrach the word mizrach means east and many traditional synagogues and some less traditional synagogues will have um, a little sign or a beautiful piece of art on an eastern wall to let you know which way to face, to face east when you're praying. Um, and this is all about, this text tells us, um, I think we're not going to read it all, because it tells you where you are, where, if you are in this place, this is how you're supposed to stand here to pray. If you're outside the land, you pray towards the land of Israel. If you're in Jerusalem, this is where you stand. It's really, it's really um, making sure that we're all focused towards either Israel or more specifically towards Jerusalem. It's, it's really honing in on the fact that Israel and Jerusalem are the center, 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 so that all Israel find and here Israel means the people of Israel finds itself play, praying towards one place. All right. This is a very, Yehuda Halevi is a very famous physician and philosopher and poet. He lived in Spain and then he tried to go to the land of Israel um, 
in about 1141 and there's a lot of controversy they thought he got stuck in some people thought he just made it to israel and died right when he got there some people think he only made it as far as egypt and got there but he was a very dedicated jew this is um a street in in israel that's named after him he wrote this very famous poem and this is the poem that he wrote somebody who hasn't read before if you can share that we're almost done with my presentation here if you're if you're can you if ever if you're not reading can you please put yourself on mute thank you okay yehuda alevi 11th century spain my heart is in the east my heart is in the east and i am at the furthermost west how can i taste what I eat, and how could it be pleasing to me? How shall I render my vows and my bonds, while yet Zion lies beneath the fetter of Edom, and I am in the chains of Arabia? It would be easy for me to leave all the bounty of Spain, as it is precious for me to behold the dust of the desolate sanctuary. So, um he where he's longing to be in israel look at the years here it's before the spanish inquisition right but what's beginning to happen the crusades are beginning to um take place and there was a huge terrible massacre in the 1300s in spain called the chemnitsky massacres so anti-Semitism is already started to raise its head. Whenever you see the mention of the word Edom and the Edomites, it is um, a euphemism for enemies. Arabia is also a euphemism for enemies. So here, He's referring to the fact that the crusaders have begun to take over what's happening in the land of Israel. He feels oppression and anti-Semitism taking place in Spain, but he longs to be in the land of Israel. I am in the East and my heart, my, my heart is in the East and I am in the furthermost West. He really longs to be in Israel because that's his home. And yet he's stuck in Spain. And eventually he makes his way there. And he doesn't feel like he can eat or drink or make his, you know, Yom Kippur vows or pray because he's not in his home. That's how important the land of Israel is to him. One more piece before we get to, so Hatikva. Hatikva is actually, so it really means the hope. It was written in the year 1886 by an English poet who was originally from Bohemia. Anybody know that? And the music was written by an immigrant from Moldavia. Now, Hatikva itself is very controversial. Um, so long as within the inmost heart a Jewish spirit sings, so long as the eye looks eastward, gazing toward Zion, our hope is not lost. The hope of 2,000 years to be a free people in our land, the land of Zion and Jerusalem. Because this is the Israel national anthem. If Israel is a Jewish democratic state, why is... So this tells us our, why um, Israel is important to the Jewish people. And I don't want to... We're not going to have a long discussion about this now, but why is this controversial? Because there are people who live in Israel who are not Jewish. Exactly. So that's why you'll see the Arab members of Knesset will probably not stand when Hatikva is being sung. And there's a whole discussion about that. And that's another discussion for another time. So I'm going to stop the screen share now. So just from some of these texts, you can see Ahavat Zion, love of Zion, is deeply embedded in the texts of our people in biblical text, in rabbinic text, in poetry. So love of the land, 
Love of the country is something that's so important to our soul. We know that God says to Abraham, leave your home, your birthplace, your father's house, and go to a place that I will tell you. I will give you this land as inheritance, and I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the heavens and the sea in the sky. But he doesn't go to a land that's empty of any other inhabitants. It's a land that's shared by other people. And God made that same promise to other people as well. It's not a promise that's unique to God and the Jewish people. And Israel, the people of Israel, are also called Or Legoyim, a light to the nations. And through probably 1973, through um, the War for Independence, through the Sinai Campaign in 1956, through the Six-Day War in 1967, through the Yom Kippur War, Israel lived up to that notion of Or La Goyim, a light to the nations. But I think we held Israel to a higher standard. We don't talk about the United States. Now we do. But we didn't talk about United States, Ameri you know, um, people coming to the United States and taking land away, or Canada taking land away from Native Americans. We don't talk about what, you know, we learn about manifest destiny in high school, but we don't really talk about what is manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is taking land away from people who lived here before we did. You know, we used to tell the story about people buying New York for some, you know, exchanging it for beads. I grew up, I'm from New England. The symbol for New England was a pilgrim's hat with an arrow through it. What does that say? That's not a symbol of, of New England anymore. It still is the pilgrim hat. But that is still, that might be offensive to some people, that it's still a pilgrim's hat, right? But nobody really criticizes, though now we know that Columbus Day is offensive to some people. Um, Thanksgiving, when you're in Massachusetts, Thanksgiving is not a holiday that is celebrated by, thanks, by Native Americans, American Thanksgiving. It is a day of mourning for Native Americans. Because what does Thanksgiving talk about? So it, it, there are alternative um, celebrations or commemorations, not celebrations, on American Thanksgiving. So once we get past the Yom Kippur War in 1973 and we move forward in um, Israel history, the people of Israel become more grown up. And you can't be a nation with other people living in your midst without having complications. What happens with the West Bank and Gaza? I'm going to share some maps with you now. Hang on. Oh. I have to stop the other. I have to stop the other screen share. Okay, now. Now, give me one second. My problem is, I can't see them to start. There we go. Now I just have to adjust the um, my screen. Hang on, it's not letting me adjust them. 
Ah, give me one sec. All right, I guess I have to make this slide fit. If you hear a sound in the background, I apologize. It's my fan on my computer. Okay. So this is, um, if you're sending me a chat, I can't really look at the chat and do the presentation at the same time. So, um, Israel was divided up by God and the Israelites were given, each tribe was given a different piece of the land. Then in 1916, under the British mandate and the sykes pico Agreement, it was divided up differently, right? So here the Arab states were given this piece. It's hard to see, I know. There was, the Arab states were under French protection over here. This was um, under Great Britain and French protection and Russian protection. This looks like a piece of Lebanon over here. Lebanon used to be called, um, and Beirut especially, the Paris of the Middle East. Then we come to over here. We're not going to have time to really go into this, but it just gives you a sense of things, right? The Ottoman Empire ruled the Middle East from 1517 to 1917. And you can get a sense of how they ruled it. We're not going to go into all of this, but I just want you to get it to see this. During the British Mandate Rule, you can see what Palestine looked like. Very different shape than what it looks like now, right? But you can see Syria was over here. Iraq was under, so Syria was under the French Mandate. Iraq was under the British Mandate. You had Egypt over here and Saudi Arabia over here. When you had the Balfour Declaration, and my slide is not, so the Balfour Declaration during 1917, which said, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Then you had the UN partition plan. Like how many countries go through all of this, right? So you had, this was supposed to be an Arab state over here. This was now West Bank actually. This is Gaza over here. This was supposed to be a Jewish state, and this was supposed to be a Jewish state, and this was supposed to be Arab, so the Jews weren't going to get very much in the UN partition plan. After the 1948 War of Independence, this was under Jordanian rule. I have to move this because I can't see my screen. Here's Lebanon. This all became Israel, that's Egypt, Transjordan. I know I'm going very fast because I want to give time for a discussion, but I, thought, I think it was important to put all this in context. So here is West Bank. Here's Gaza. There is not a lot of distance between the West Bank and Gaza. Gaza, I have a movie called Precious Life, which won an award in an Israel film festival. If I can find it, it's packed in a box. It's a really important, it was made during Operation um, Iron Lead or Cast Lead or whatever. It's a really important movie to see and I think we should, at one point I should show it to you. Um, it's about people from Gaza who get help for their um, son who's very sick and they get help at Hadassah Hospital. There's not a lot of distance between Gaza and Tel Aviv, between Gaza and the West Bank. Gaza is very different than the West Bank. Hamas 
shoots missiles from Gaza. Any place in the south, my, you can't see my arrow. Any place in the south is really impacted by that. And they're now hitting Tel Aviv. They're hitting other places. That's not what this is about. Six day war happens. They take over, they take back Jerusalem. If you have not read Yossi Klein Halevi's book, Like Dreamers, I highly recommend it. It talks about how they retook Jerusalem during the Six Day War. And it's an amazing book. They took back Sinai. So pre and post 1967 borders. This is pre 67, post 67. Sinai, I was actually in Israel, my first year of rabbinic school, when they gave Sinai back to, e to Egypt. I, I have been in the Sinai Desert. I've camped out there. Both before it was Egypt and after it was Egypt. So here is a current map of Israel showing the green line. The green line is what is um, currently Israel, and this is Gaza. And not Gaza, West Bank. Golan Heights. West Bank. Bethlehem is here. Hebron is here. Hebron is its own um, very complicated issue. We can, uh, I'm not, we're not going to talk about that now. We'll talk about that at a different time. I've been to Hebron three times. I've been to Hebron when it was still under Israeli rule, and I've been under it three times three times now. Tulkarim is often a hotbed of activity. Nablus, Janine. Um, but it's important to see all of this. Gaza. There's no grass in Gaza. Gaza is a cement city. Densely, densely packed with millions of people. Um... All right, so um, I just wanted you to show you those maps. There's more on all of that now, but I don't want to. I just wanted you to see what we're talking about. So the situation in Israel is very complicated, and and. People don't always understand what the story is. When Yasser Arafat made a peace pact with Yitzhak Rabin and Carter, it was very lovely, right? They all shook hands on the White House lawn. So nice. Millions and millions of dollars flew, um, flew, uh, were sent in to the Palestinian Authority. It was supposed to be used to build up infrastructure in Gaza and the West Bank. It was meant to improve lives for the Palestinian people. Where's that money now? What happened to Yasser Arafat and his family? Where's his wife? Does anybody know where his wife is now? Paris. That money, unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority is highly, highly corrupt. That money went to the hands of the rich, and the average Joe Schmo Palestinian lives in a state of dire poverty. The average Joe Schmo Palestinian is at the mercy of Hamas, Fatah. Fatah is actually now on the losing end. Hamas has taken over and... and um, Gaza, and probably Rabbi Weinberg will talk about this tomorrow. But, and at the press, the average Joshua Shmo Palestinian wants to go to work, feed their family, and live a life. The average Israeli wants to go to work, feed their family, and live a life. Israel does not want to oppress people. And there's two different stories, two different narratives that we have to be aware of. I'm gonna go, um, there are Arab Israelis who live within the confines of Israel, not in Gaza and the West Bank, right? 
Those Arab Israelis have Israeli passports. They are Israeli citizens. The Arabs who live in West Bank and Gaza, they are not Israeli citizens. They are under the, they are citizens of the Palestinian Authority. And there's a third group. The Arabs who live in East Jerusalem, they are not um, Israeli citizens, they are not Israeli citizens, and they are not under the authority of um, the Palestinian Authority, and they are not citizens of Jordan. They are kind of no man's land, and it's really complicated. What makes things more complicated is there's a two-class system in Israel. Arab Israelis are full Israeli citizens, yet their school systems are inferior because they don't get the same kind of funding. They don't get the same kind of garbage um, services. They don't get the same kind of water services. Because they live on is Israel land, their cities are not allowed to spread out like this. Their cities then have to move up like this. So they live in very densely packed towns. And their lives are not the same. It's a two-class system. There are organizations in Israel with joint Jewish Israeli and Palestinian Israeli directors that are fighting for the civic equality of Israeli Arabs. One is called Sikui, for the civic advancement of Arab Israelis. And the reform movement in Israel supports those organizations. The other is the New Israel Fund. The other is IRAC, the Israel Religious Action Center. Because if you're Israeli, it, doesn't, it shouldn't matter if you are Palestinian, if you are Jewish, if you are Christian, if you're Israeli, you're Israeli. You should be afforded full access to anything your taxes pay for. In the Arab Israeli towns, no Arabic bus stop signs or road signs. Everything is in Hebrew. That's not fair. If, what if they don't speak Hebrew? The sign should be in the language that they speak in. What happens in Gaza and the West Bank is that Hamas purposefully uses civilians as human shields. And they will purposefully put weapons of destruction in, in the civilians' homes, and they will build tunnels, go with huge tunnels that go from the homes into Israel so that they can infiltrate Israel and then um, kidnap soldiers and civilians. And they do it on purpose so that when there's action, that they know that the Israelis will strike back, but then they end up, the Israelis will end up having to harm civilians. And, the, and Israel does notify when there's going to be an attack. They'll send leaflets, they'll do announcements, but Hamas will say to their civilians, do not leave your house. Do not leave. And I can show you photos of what these huge tunnels are. And Hamas will then also stage photos. So what you see in the press is not always accurate. Israel suffers from a propaganda disaster, but they also will make mistakes. What happened at the end of Ramadan was not something that should have happened. And I'm sure Rabbi Weinberg will talk about that. So when people read things in the press, they develop a, um, a feeling about Israel should or should not be doing this. So how do we have a love of Israel when people have different opinions? So it's 1244, so let's open it up for a dialogue. I've thrown out a lot of information. Questions? Comments. It's dead silence. I have a question. Yes. 
Uh, one of the oh, things- Judith Vales just asked a question. What's the noise in the background? I'm sorry. It's the fan from my computer. When I'm on Zoom, my computer gets very hot and the fan goes off and I can't control that. Sorry. It's really when I'm on Zoom. I apologize. Uh, when um, they, the Israelis attack the mosque, when that happened, um, that is considered a war crime, I'm told, is it? That, yes, and I think Josh Weinberg is a better one to ask about that. He can speak about that more directly. Can, so I'm going to ask us to like put that in a parking lot and ask that tomorrow when Rabbi Weinberg is on. He, I think he is a better equipped to answer that question. It's, a, I, it's definitely an act of provocation. I think what is very upsetting to me was uh, recently when I would go on like YouTube, I saw nothing that was pro-Israeli. Everything was like condemning Israel. Yeah. Wherever I looked and um, that was very um, upsetting. And secondly, what was upsetting was my son... Um, asked me about that and um he saw i guess a video in which an israeli um soldier was throwing about to throw a grenade at an ambulance and um he asked me about that i'm told that sometimes um hamas uses ambulance to put their soldiers in and transport people but on Netflix, there's a movie about these children that, um, uh, Palestinian children, and one of them mentions how his father was an ambulance driver, and they, the family always thought that um, he was safe, and he was taking a group of wounded people to the hospital when, um, of course, um, the Israeli attacked the ambulance and killed everyone in the ambulance, including his um, father, which was rather sad. So, so I, can't, I can't comment on that particular episode, um, Ruth, but this is what I have to go say. You can find, um, you can find on YouTube videos to support either side. If you are very pro-Israel, there are videos to support your side. If you're very anti-Israel, you can find videos to support that side. There's always information to back up whichever side you want to support. There's news articles to support either side. If you are um, of any particular persuasion, you can always find things to support your side. What is key is to know who is going to be the least biased in their reporting and who is going to show you both sides? Um, and who is the most fair? And some of those videos are manipulated, right? Sometimes they will show you a fake ambulance. And sometimes they will show you fake things. And sometimes they are accidents and sometimes it's true. So I can't comment on that story because I don't know if it's true or not. So I don't comment on things that I don't know about. Um, and, um, and sometimes Hamas will do things to provoke on purpose. Um, and you know, when you are the victim of multiple, multiple suicide bombings, and, um, when you have buses being blown up and cafes being blown up and grocery stores being blown up and soldiers being kidnapped and civilians being kidnapped and um, nightclubs being blown up and hotels being blown up and kids being used as suicide bombers. And when you hear mothers say about their children, I want my child to grow up to be a suicide bomber. What kind of, fa what kind of religion teaches that? Um, and um, and Hamas uses its people for its own political purpose. Hamas is not a, an organization that loves its people. It's a religion whose mandate is to destroy the people of Israel, and they will use their own people to do that. So what is the solution to getting Hamas out of Gaza? 
Well, that if, if I had that solution, I, I would be um, a really good diplomat. I don't know right now. But so this is not what this is about. This is really about how do we have a civil discourse with people who don't agree with us, right? How can we sit with people on different sides of the fence? How can I believe one thing and you believe something else? And how can I have a conversation and a dialogue with you? And how do we find accurate sources for reporting and for giving us, um, how do we know that what we're reading is accurate? So, so far the best news, the newspaper, the, you know, I read the New York Times, it's not always accurate. The best newspaper in the United States for the most accurate and unbiased opinion is the Wall Street Journal. Thank you. That has the least, there's still going to be um, inaccuracies, but the Wall Street Journal will give you the least of the unbiased. Um, if you see things from Donnell Hartman from the Hartman Institute in Israel, he's an Orthodox rabbi, but he is very open-minded. Anything from the Hartman Institute, Yossi Klein Halevi, who lives, who's formerly from the United States, Yossi Klein Halevi, anything from the Hartman Institute, they will be open-minded and they will be critical of Israel, yet love Israel. Um, Rabbi Jeff Salkin writes beautifully on this. Um, let's see, are there any other questions that we can answer? Let's give other people an opportunity to ask some questions. This is Judith, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, am I unmuted? Yeah, yes, you are. I can hear you. Um, the biggest problem that I have is talking with fellow Jews who refuse to criticize Israel about anything. It's Israel right or wrong. They don't feel that way about our own country, the United States, but they do feel that way about Israel. And I agree with you, Judith, and I, I once had somebody in, my, um, in, a, in a congregation who um, I, they, and I am not left left wing I really am center maybe a little left right and they I think they painted me as like a far lefty hating Israel and I am I love Israel I am like as Zionistic as they come so they would bombard me with these really bizarre articles about Israel that, that like that tried to prove their way because uh, and they've never, and they had never been to Israel. I said to, and I, so I met with them. And I will never engage in dialogue via email. I won't engage on Facebook. I won't engage in email. So they kept trying to engage me. And I said to this person, I said, come and meet with me in my office. I said, I don't engage in, 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 in anything like this on email. And I said to them, you, you know, I could send you just as many articles as you send me. Because you can find articles on every side. I said, have you ever been to Israel? And they said, no. I said, I've been 30 times or however many times I had been at that point. I said, why don't you, I said, I'm leading a trip. Why don't you come with me? Oh, I could never go. <laughs> I said, very hard to make a statement, those kind of statements without going. I said, I am coming from a place of deep love. I've met with people. I have friends. My best friend lives in Rehovot. My other best friends live in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And I have friends who are rabbis. And I am hearing from my friends who live there. I'm not making up this stuff myself. You know what? The bottom line is sometimes you can't argue with people because they, they have blinders on and they don't want to hear. So this is what I say. You're entitled to your view and I'm entitled to my view. And, um, and as long as you don't force me to believe what you're gonna believe. So one of my really good friends in Toronto is, a form, is, a, is an Israeli who moved to Toronto. Very, very conservative, much more right-wing, really right-wing, different than me. And we had very different views about Israel, but she, was, she lived there and she has family there. So 
we, and she was one of my best friends in, in Toronto, but we agreed to not talk about anything because we knew that we had different views. Like she, if, if somebody who was um, Iranian moved onto her street, it really bothered her. But at the same time, she had an open mind and she would take me to these um, Israeli film festivals and introduce me to these movies that were so incredible. And she would help me with things. So um, we knew what we could talk about and I would listen to her because I thought it was interesting to hear her perspective and she had lived there. And we figured out how to dance this dance and I would learn stuff from her and she would learn from me, but we figured out what we could not, could and could not discuss. But that's because we were both reasonable and rational people and we realized there were things that we could not talk about. But not everybody is that way. That's the key. And I think that's the key in life in general. There are things that you, sometimes people are so set in their ways, right? You're not going to change their mind. And for some reason, Israel's a hot button. And you see that in the U.S. Congress with the squad who wouldn't go to Israel and they were invited. How can you criticize when you can't go, when you're not even going to go and see for yourself? You see that with APAC the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and with J Street. J Street is the left-wing Israel um, advocacy organization, lobbying organization. And J Street bashes APAC publicly. APAC will never bash J Street. APAC is very left-wing. A people J Street is very left-wing. APAC, people think it's right-wing, but it's not. It's nonpartisan. And depending on who's in government, people will think what it is whatever it is. But um, if you're very left-wing, you think everybody else is too right-wing. If you're very right-wing, you think everybody else is too left-wing. And if you're in the middle, that's a hard place to be. It's hard to be firmly nonpartisan. And it's and it's Israel brings out difficult things with people. I was here with my brother the other day, and. He, um, we were trying to have a conversation about Israel, and even he didn't want to hear certain things. It's tough. That's why sometimes it's helpful first to gather all your facts. Because people can't just, and facts sometimes are, you know, alternate facts. Um, but if you know your history well, if you know what happened, you might not like it. But if you know your history, if you know your facts, I have pictures of the tunnels that got that Hamas built. You can't dispute a photograph. Yes, you can if it's a, if it's altered. Yes, you can. I guess take that back. But I've seen them with my own. I was there physically. I saw those tunnels. Um, so it's hard. But if you love Israel and you've been there, that's the best way to fight back. And if you can go again, when Israel's having a tough time is the best time to visit. To say, I'm here for you. I love you and I want to support you. Just like if you have friends who are having a tough time, you show up. So we have one minute left. So next week, so tomorrow, Rabbi Weinberg is going to really talk about the, the current situation with Gaza and Hamas, and Hamas, with Gaza, with Hamas and Israel. And he's going to talk about the elections with Naftali Bennett and Yair Lapid that just took place. That's awesome. That, um, yes, one, one quick thing, and then I really have to go. I have a question as to whether or not that program for tomorrow will be recorded because I can't participate. Yes, it's going to be recorded. Thank you. Yes. And next week, we're going to talk about um, challenges and opportunities. And we're going to go beyond some of the political stuff. And we'll touch on some of the political stuff as well. That's next week. And the week after, we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at some poetry, some Jewish poetry and some Arab poetry. And I'm not going to tell you which is which. And you're going to have to figure out which is which because without knowing 
who wrote the poetry. You're not going to be able to, all you're going to see is a deep love for the land. And we'll talk about that. And um, I learned some of this from Revan Sandler. Do you know Revan Val? So, um, and we're going to talk about the connection to the land. We're going to try to put ourselves in both of these people's mindset. There's so much. We could do a whole long, a whole year long course on this. You'll hear um, Rabbi Weinberg just came back, like, re like just from Israel. He just went to say, I love you. We're here for you, but to see about the current situation. And he met with people on all sides. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to hear his view, having just come back from Israel. He went on a fact-finding mission, um, and it'll be really interesting to see. So I know I tried to squeeze a lot in, and we just touched on little bits, but there's so much more. And if you have questions you want answered, email me rabbi sobel at tbz.org and uh, maybe we'll do a fourth session later on just to do a Q&A but um, okay there you go thank have you a great, rabbi have a great week everybody thank you very much thank you rabbi you're welcome <laughs>